Yeah, indeed, I follow my bike. And the irony of this is uh, uh, I got one of the many questions you got when you get a Nobel Prize, this famous one, which is, uh, oh, how did you hear about this? And usually they have to ask you explain the famous phone call and blah, blah, blah. In my case, it was disappointing because actually they didn't have the right phone number. So they never reached me. So it was the University of Cambridge who called me and told me, oh, are you aware you won the Nobel Prize? That's all I learned. <laughs> <laughs> so I get it. And then, and then the second question you get is, of course, what do you do with the price? And uh, that day was just a disaster because I had problems with my bike in the morning. And then I, I, I said, I said, oh, I'm going to buy a new bike. <laughs> and it went completely like a buzz everywhere in the press. And actually, that is the famous bike I bought. <laughs> I think I just overstepped too much. It's just too fast for me. I just have to slow down. <laughs> okay. Um, no, uh, what I'm trying to, uh, to convey to you is a little bit the story of what it is. I mean, uh, it's a very uh, a friendly and very informal talk I will present to you. I will just give you some inside story that I don't give to all the talks. Is what really happened there. And, uh, and essentially, this, this Nobel Prize is interesting because it's talking about improving the understanding of the evolution of the universe and Earth place in the cosmos. So it means it has connected two fields, which is dealing with the... Uh, the, the bigger size, this is James Peeble, you see on the, on the left side, which is dealing with the origin of the universe. At the same time, they're placing into context the first discovery of a planet, which is changing also the, the perspective of our own solar system. So I think it's an interesting message they send here. And I will try to explain to you what has changed really. Uh, there is a lot known, but it's much profound than that. I think there is a really a revolution going on on our perspective. And, and eventually this would lead to a, possibly to a new definition of life and finding life uh, outside the, the life on Earth. There is certainly this direction. That I'm not going to talk about that, but that's, uh, that's certainly uh, somewhere uh, in the remote future. Um, okay, how should I move the, uh, the slide here? Uh, I press on this? Oh yeah, here we are. So uh, to start the story, you have to start the story somewhere. For me, the story started there. Um, it was in, um, in 99 when I started my PhD. This is the Observatoire Haute Provence. It's a beautiful, lovely place in the southern of France. You see the oak tree. There's plenty of oak trees. It's beautiful. The smell is just magic over there. And the reason why I mean, the story started there, it's always a matter of opportunity somewhat in science. So the opportunity is the following. There is a telescope that is from the 60s. Actually, it's a UK-built telescope. It's Group Parson who built it. This is the 193 centimeter size telescope, which is the size of the diameter of the mirror. And then there's another machine, which is called Coravel here, that was something that Michel Mayer did in the 70s, actually in 77. That's the first machine that was systematically able to measure the speed of the star. Why do you get the speed of the star? You want to find if there is something around the stars, like the binary stars. And the connection is pretty interesting because the origin of this comes from Cambridge, actually this Cambridge, uh, because someone here called Roger Griffin, which is a professor at the Observatory of Cambridge, um, can invented the principle, uh, the idea of uh, how this machine was built. So I think it's an interesting story that's connecting with Cambridge here. So the reason why uh, all this goes together, because Michel Mayor was looking to improve this, to do something better, and the Observatoire Haute Provence wanted to build a new machine, a spectrograph, to uh, get the spectra of stars. And uh, all this went together, and that's why I would like to explain to you, and that's where I, my, my, I still my story start. Okay, so first, it's something I have to acknowledge. I mean, to build the machine, uh, the machine I will be talking about, it's not only me and Michelle, there's a whole team around it. And that's interesting because this is all the people. Um, uh, the picture is um, when we were celebrating the 15th anniversary. So there were the people all gray hair. They were not gray hair at that time. But this is interesting because it's all the engineers of Observatoire de Rhodes Provence. And they were really excited to build a new machine. But at that time, what we were doing was absolutely unique. <coughs> because we were the only astronomers. It's Michel uh, in the center, you see, and me just in the back. Uh, all the other are people uh, expert about optics, uh, electronics, and all the elements that you need to build this together. What we designed at that time was seen as a so awkward project that no one was at all interested about this. We did that really in a way alone. And the reason why we did it alone, because it was absolutely a kind of a revolutionary instrument. It was just so much in advance compared to uh, what could have been done. And that's the reason why, I mean, we made this breakthrough. Okay, the principle, the idea of what we're doing is pretty simple. And it's very old. I mean, the technology, the idea, 
uh, you can trace this back to Newton almost. It's just the fact when you have a planet orbiting a star that you see the planet in blue here orbiting the star. If you look at the star, there's a tiny bit of an orbit with the star. So there is a big orbit from the planet, but there's a tiny orbit of the star. The orbit is pretty small, actually. If you look at the orbit of the sun in our solar system, it's within the size of the sun. So it's very tiny. But this orbit is the key of the discovery. So you don't need to see the planet to guess that there is a planet, actually. You can just look at the star, which is way more easier because the planet is so faint, it's almost invisible. So um, what you do, you don't detect the motion of the star, which is very complicated. It's called the astrometry. And it was something people tried already and failed. What you do is you detect the change in the radial direction, which is called the speed or radial velocity. And if you look at the tiny wave that you see here, that tries to, to picture uh, the change of the wavelength, which is called that the Doppler effect. It's the 90s a French uh, physicist, that Mr. Doppler, who uh, described this. And what you do have, practically, if you measure the light from the stars, you can detect this change. It's a very tiny change, but this tiny change in speed of the star tells you that there is a planet. So the idea, I think, is, is, is older, uh, and, and, but nobody really was able to implement that to detect planet because the ratio of the mass between the planet, like Jupiter, for example, and, and, the, and the, the sun is 1,000. So it's a massive ratio. So Jupiter, in its motion, makes only a tiny change into the speed of the sun. And actually, it's about the speed of a running man you're trying to detect. So it's extremely difficult to do that when you're trying to do that on an on, on object which is extremely remote. And that's really a technical challenge. It's not the idea, which is pretty simple. It's how could you do that practically. So I would try to give you a little bit of an idea of, uh, of the principle. So my, my task was, OK, let's make a machine that has the capability to do that. So technically, it's an, almost an impossible job. Because that's a, that's a spectra. When you record the spectra, you have a tiny uh, absorption line, which is related to the chemistry you have in the atmosphere. And every line you have here, it's an absorption line related to an element, like a lot of iron and anything you have in the atmosphere of the star, is going to imprint the spectra and make this kind of absorption line. So you have the flux and the vertical axis and the wavelength in your horizontal axis, like a rainbow, but with tiny, tiny detail. Um, so, so the idea is there is a lot of information here. And, and the, the art of trying to deal with that is trying to bring all this into a single entity. So, so my job was trying to build up the, the whole software that would bring that into a single piece of information where all these lines would be together and be creating that kind of signal. So that's a signal that we observe at the telescope. That's the only thing we see, practically. It's something we make, mathematically speaking, into uh, the computer. So I remember when we had, um, when we had with the announced the detections and the, the, the TV crew coming and asking us, well, well could, you sh could you show us something about this planet? And it was very disappointing for them because the only thing we could show, it was just a list of number that were related to this signal. And what we're trying to find here is not even the signal, it's the tiny motion here of this signal. So you, you can have an idea. This is a real, a real signal that we got from, from um, the star 51 peg 30 years ago. And I would like to attract your attention to the scale. So if you move the speed of the star by 20 kilometers per second, it's not meters, it's kilometers here per second, right? Um, you would move the position of this line of that, of that amount. Well, the problem is if you have Jupiter orbiting a star, the effect is 10 meter per second. So it is nothing. So you don't see it. It's invisible. So it's really something which has to, you have to build up the, the whole machinery to make sure that you can understand what you're doing here. And that's really that was the challenge. And that's why it has never been done before. Because that was a real, a real, um, real problem to do that. Now, to do that, you have to build the equipment to do that. And, and again, the equipment would have been impossible uh, 10 years before we started. And uh, I would like to just drive you a little bit uh, the kind of equipment we're building. This is a machinery called LOD. Maybe you can read the, the, the name. That, uh, that was the tool that we use uh, to detect this planet. Actually, this is the machine I spend most of my time with. Because since I was the only astronomer who was my professor, I was always going back and forth between Geneva and Observatoire de Haute Provence. It's a very nice uh, 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 trip because there's a train, so you go to a, a, a pass called La Croix Haute, if you know the place. It's beautiful. 
And uh, when you cross, you move from the, from the rainy northern part of the Alps to the southern part, which is usually very dry, very sunny. So it's always very nice. I used to go back and forth, back and forth many, many times, because every time they were putting something, we have to do the measurements and everything. So that's the tool that you use to build this famous spectra, or rainbow. So this tool is unique for different aspects. I would like to drive you through that. So the first one is the tool is doing what's called a live, large wavelength. It means we get the whole visible spectra at the same time. And the high resolutions, it means all these kind of tiny lines, you just see them. So that's why you have this, all this mirror, this bouncing. That's the reason why you have this piece of equipment here. That's the magic piece of it. That's called the grating. That is making the, the spectroscopy. This grating at that time, in the 90s, was the first prototype ever, ever built because he has a very steep angle uh, seen from that mirror. So actually the, the light bounces on that mirror, bounces back here and bounces back here, and there's something in the middle, bounces back and go up there. So, so this angle is the, is the key uh, for making the, um, uh, the spectra. And what you don't see, there's a lot of uh, very tiny rules here, with a very specific shape, and that makes the spectra. And uh, the spectra are usually called no, R4 because it's a tangent 4 angle. And uh, no, they commonly used everywhere, but that was the first piece being built ever. And, and we were very nervous. I was very nervous, I remember, because without that, there will be no instrument and no PhD. And, uh, and there have been a couple of years delay, actually, to do it. But Michel was very confident because he told me anywhere there is so much of a people waiting for that gratings. So since we are the first one, we just have to pay a little bit the waiting list. But then after, after there, there's so much pressure, and all the telescopes in the world having instruments of that kind, I know, and there's maybe a dozen, they're all using the same, the same kind of one, but much bigger. That's the first small piece of it. So that's the first piece of equipment that makes the machine very, very special. The second piece of equipment that you do see on the bottom, it's optical fibers. You may have recognized the optical fibers here in, uh, in orange. They were known already in the 80s, and they were used by the telecom in the 80s. But what happened in the 90s is some people managed to use this optical fiber in a very clever way for astronomy. They usually use in the near infrared when you do a telecom, but in astronomy, we want to use it in the visible, and it's not easy to do it properly in the visible. So we were using the first kind of fiber available for astronomers, and what is very difficult is how you connect the fibers in a proper way with the instrument. There's a kind of a very complex tool here that has been designed. An optical fiber was magic, because you don't need to stick at the telescope. Usually all this machine has to be bolt on the back of the telescope and it's moving during the night, it's getting the cold and everything. So you don't have to do that. You bring the light, you bring your fiber, you have to build the equipment to, to maintain the fiber on the telescope. You bring the light down and practically the, the star that you observe with your telescope is beamed down into the spectrograph. And what is even better, because it's a, it's a fiber, the fiber has this property to mix up the light and when it comes here, it's very stable, it's very flat, it's beautiful. So it brings you a very stable machinery. We were the first instrument using the fiber that way. So the grating was the first, uh, first piece of the kit. The fiber is the second one. But that's not all. We got very lucky because at that time, if you remember, there were complete revolutions in the computers. What happened is a new kind of computer show up in the market. That's a Sun Microsystem. So the reason why it was absolutely magical because they were built up of a new technology on the chip. It's called the Spark technology. And the Spark technology were very clever because the people who made the company here, they used to work with this big mainframe you may have heard about it. It's called the, the Cray, the Cray computers, the big mainframe. So they used to inherit the Cray system technology to build the Spark, and the Spark has been used by, by microsystems. So for me, that was magical. Because with this, you could use 32-bit computer. At that time, it was not possible to do that. It was, we were talking about 8-bit PC. And I could really build a code, the whole software to analyze this data, optimize this computer. So it was a very, very expensive piece of equipment. But all this together, we were able to build a machine and that would deliver exactly what we wanted and the way we wanted. And what we wanted is to reach this magical number of about 10 meters because 10 meter is the effect of Jupiter on the sun. So if you be able to make a machine that reaches this, this capability of measurements, that's it. Technically, you have the potential to detect a planet. And that's the beginning of the story. So that's why I spend a lot of time to design the codes and to implement all the, a lot of, we don't have to take so many decisions here. I mean, how the fiber will illuminate the stuff, or we will install this and that. So this is a very interesting process. So sometimes, 
you have to realize that behind, behind a discovery, there is an intensive effort with the Wool team to build something to make it possible. So it's not a piece of luck that we're able to do that. It was absolutely a full dedicated new kind of technology. No, this instrument has been replicated. That's the first of this series, and they all build on the same principle. And of course, they have improved. Right now, the technology, I'm building now uh, maybe the fourth or fifth generation of this machine. They're reaching an accuracy of not 10 meters, but 10 centimeters per second right now. To give you the kind of gain we're getting by using the same stuff, but learning how to use all, the, all this together. Now, um, what happened here is all this happened, all this discovery happened, and that's, that's, a, that's a fun part of it, is because we had in mind at that time a planet like the solar system. That was the only planet that everybody had in mind. So practically when we started the program was in 94, um, my PhD was not about detecting the planet. It was about setting up the machinery, you know, where we would start the program, and I was doing also plenty of other research for this machine you could be doing. And, uh, and, and I got the key of the telescope practically, I mean literally, and, and Michel, Michel decided that was a good time for him just to take a break and to go in sabbatical. He decided to go in Hawaii, very far away. So, and it was so far away at that time, the email was barely working, and it's not really uh, something that uh, you get in touch every day. So I was really on my own, uh, practically, with the machine. And uh, he told me, just start the program. And I said, well, it's super fun, I will do that. And, and then he, he told me, well, be careful, and you're not going to find any planet, huh? just be aware. But you have to just do enough measurements to have something to show in your PhD that the machine is working. <laughs> I said, great, let's do that. So um, I had my list of stars, we had 120 stars, and I decided to pick 20 or 30 stars that were the brightest one. And off I go, so you go every uh, one, two months, you go observing between September and November 94, and you take data, you take data, you just compare the data. And that's, that's the first point that, uh, that I have here, one, two point. You see, this is, a, this is the value of the radial velocity the first two days, and then after you get to two others here and two other, and then in November, that star was a little bit strange because it, it's not very stable. There's something really moving on. Here, this is a solution at the end, but the solution was not in my mind at that point. So in November, I came back. I said, well, I came back in Geneva. I said, well, maybe I should be more careful with that star when I be back in January. Of course, I didn't men mention this to, to Michel because he was in Hawaii. I didn't want to bother him with that. Nothing was really going on special. I was running the program. It was pretty cool. So I came back in January uh, and uh, keep observing that star. And then it, it became kind of a panic mode because the first point I'm getting, all this point, were absolutely everywhere. And uh, I, I was doing measurements one day, and I realized the data was there. And then I did it the second day. And because of the machinery we had built and the fact we had this tool, which was very powerful. Oh, by the way, we did a trick. Because I was not happy in 94 that I would have to wait more than one night to get my data. I wanted to get my data right away. Because in case something was wrong, I wanted to be able to just find out. So I find, I discussed with some of my uh, a software engineer, and he told me that we can trick the, um, the, the processor of the machine and make it 50% faster. It was pretty cool. But I was a bit nervous because the heat was much more important <laughs> in the machine. But we managed to do it. We increased the clock, the clocking, and that was a, a final solution for me because I was able to process the data in 30 minutes. So I had my observation, 30 minutes later, I got the data. Right now, I can use my cell phone and do that in 30 seconds. So you see what kind of progress we've been doing uh, for this. So I got the data right away. And, and I was in this kind of state of mind that, oh my God, this is really going wrong. And the first thing that I had in my mind at that point is, I'm, I have a big bug in my software and something is wrong in the instrument. And I really literally panicked at that time because I was just six or nine months before my PhD. And I realized that for, uh, for the last three years, I did something and had a big, massive problem that, uh, and just at the end. So what was wrong? So I get a little bit obsessed on that, on that star, as you can imagine. You know, I start observing like crazy. You see all these points. And then at some point, I, was, I, I checked everything I could. But the only thing that I ended up with is say, well, it has to be real because I find no mistakes in my code. There is no mistakes, it's true. And I started to play with the data and I had this completely crazy idea, well, maybe I should try to fit an orbit into this data to find a period. I found this period of four days and I managed to find an orbit. And uh, I said, okay, there is an orbit, there is four days. Uh, maybe it's a planet. It was absolutely crazy at that time, but that's the only thing I came up with. So I ended up with March. Uh, um, Michel was coming in April back. I sent him a fax, Anthony, Michel, I think I found a planet. And I, I, really, 
And uh, it was, I remember, I, I included the plot, and I said, it's four days planet, this is the mass of Jupiter. And, uh, and it was really nice. I mean, I, by, I was very fortunate to, uh, to, do, uh, to have him as a supervisor, because uh, he said, yes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what I learned much later, he admitted to me, after a long dinner and a lot of drinks, that he didn't believe me. <laughs> but he wanted to be nice with me. But I think it was a good thing I remember when, with my students as well. So you don't have to believe them, but whatever you think, you should be nice. <laughs> so he was nice, he was very skeptical. And he has all, all reason to get skeptical. And we have to wait to come back. And he took, it, he took him some time to get skeptical. So why is why it so special? Why was it so um, amazingly different? Because the planet doesn't make any sense. It was a Jupiter mass planet. It, the orbit is 8 million kilometers away. The, the Earth is 150 million kilometers away. So it was very, very close. So it was really 5% uh, of the distance, 5-10% of the distance, uh, uh, from the, from distance from the Earth orbiting the Sun. So extremely close, so extremely hot in a way. Uh, and, uh, and then there is no way to explain this. Uh, it's either you move Jupiter very close, or you take something and you strip it out. And that's what we said when we produced the paper. Essentially, we said, okay, there is an object. That's the only thing we can, we can explain. Um, it doesn't make any sense to us, but there is no other explanation here. So I would try to convey to you why it was so shocking at that time. And I have to go a little bit into the theory of the formation of the planet, but I will make it very simple in a way you get the point here. So why this planet was so much of a problem? Well, the first idea, which is, comes back to the 19th century from Laplace, is you have this concept of disk. The reason why you have a disk is uh, you have a principle in physics it's called the angular momentum conservation. So you can never really get rid of the rotations. It's very, very difficult. You always keep it. And, uh, and naturally, when you build up a star, you have stuff around the star, really stuff, which is small, uh, small particle and also a lot of gas. And it, it, it builds up a disk. So you see this kind of beautiful picture of a disk, which is taken by a radio series of millimeter telescope called ALMA, which is in Chile on the Altiplano. And what you see here is the, is the thermal emission of this disk. Actually, it's not the gas. It's just all the small particles that emits light. So the, the, the interesting part of this is there is not also a lot of gas, mostly the gas you have in the sun, which is hydrogen. You don't see it. It's almost invisible, very difficult to detect when it's neutral. And uh, you have a mixture of gas of all kinds, because of course you have all the kind of gas you can find, all the natural gas you have, you have them here. So what is happening here is you can look where is the gas, and at what time the gas start to uh, become solid. You know if you have water in the, gaze, in the gaseous form, if you cool it down enough, because there is no pressure, it will never get to liquid form, it will go directly to a solid form. It will become a snowflake, if you want, or ice. That's what you get. So you can do that with all the gas. You have the water, it's very much close to the center, and, and then depending on the temperature when there is the transitions from the gas to the solid, you move away, and you have CO2, CH4, CO, and on and on and on and on. So, so essentially, you have a phase transition between a gas, which is a massive component into a disk, into the solid. So why does it matter? Because the gas follow a rules that maintain the, the disk into a given shape. So you cannot really make it much smaller. It's a bit like when you try to compress gas, there's something just good against it. There's no way you're going to compress it. As soon as you take the same element but making solid, it's not anymore a gas. It becomes a solid particle. Because it's a solid particle, the only thing that solid particle is going to be responding to is the gravity, while the gas is going to be supported by the pressure, by the what's called hydrostatic equilibrium. So it's much more uh, difficult to make it um, falling apart. So as soon as you have the small particle, all these particles, they will fall. And how are they going to fall? Well, I show you another disk to give you an idea. Uh, seen from the, from, the, from the edge. That's a disk from the edge. It's another star. It's beta pictoris, but this gives you the idea. This is a disk that you see from all these solid particles that are falling on the mid plan. So it gives you an idea that this big, massive disk, when they start transitioning from gas to solid, they fall, and they settle down here. They start to oscillate a little bit because of the gravity, but not very much. They keep the rotation because there's nothing it can do. It's like, a, it's like any satellite orbiting the Earth. So they keep the rotation around the star, but they're falling here. What happened? Well, it's like uh, if you go to the market on, sat on, on Saturday during the summer here. Everybody starts to bump into each other, right? So it's exactly what's happening here. 
So all these solid particles, they start touching each other, they're gluing each other, and this is how you make the planet formation. So the transition of the solid particle is the essence of the planet formations. So because you have a lot of gas and because you have a lot of water, you end up with a lot of icy particles, and they're very easy to glue each other. You have been playing with snow, you know it's easy to bring snow and to make snow, big snow stuff. Well, you can use also uh, the other solid particles that, that have no gaseous phase. If you go very close, for example, and the silicate, for example, but they are much more difficult to just glue each other. So if you try to build a very sand uh, castle, there is a limit. Well, if you do that in snow, you can go very, very high. So, so exactly the same principle here. So this is why th there is, a, there is a, an understanding that when you form a big planet, you have to start from the icy particle. And that's why you have to be far enough to have icy particle, to have this happening. And the typical distance is the distance of Jupiter. Because closer it becomes, it's too hot for the water. And that's the origin of the formation of Jupiter. So you form the, the core of Jupiter, and because it's very quick, then you, you form something big enough, and then you start to drag in a lot of gas, which is left over, and you make Jupiter. If you want to make something like the Earth, it's much more slower, it takes a much more painful time, so you start gluing all these tiny bits of solid particle, but by the time you do that, the gas is gone, because the gas has an hydrostatic uh, instability here, and it, don't, it doesn't last long enough for you to build up something uh, significantly big to attract the gas. This is why we have the telluric planet in the kind of inner part of the solar system, and then you get some kind of place when there is kind of a destroyed planet, which is the, which is the belt between, between Mars and then Jupiter. And then you have the big planets, Jupiter and Saturn. And then you have something which is a bit less big because it is a bit farther away, so they had less time to build up and less material. So this is the idea, and it, it makes sense. There's a lot of theory. There has been a lot of space mission being signed. And we can even test that because we go to Jupiter, and we can measure this in Jupiter. So you get to Jupiter, you send a probe, and you can count how many uh, carbon, nitrogen, all this there is, and you can compare with this kind of model. And it match. It match roughly. So we know that Jupiter has been formed outside. So how come do you get to Jupiter so close? And frankly, when we made the announcement, uh, nobody believed us, because, because it doesn't fit into the, uh, the global landscape. And that's why it has expanded the perspective. Because actually, we are a bit too much focused on the solar systems. And actually, the planetary formation is way more complicated than that. And that's not the only way to form a planet. There's a lot, a lot of other ingredients that has to come into it. Before I'm talking about that, I would like to tell you, to talk to you about something that was the, the tough time. When you make a major discovery, you always have a tough time. And it was really tough, actually, for me as a student following just my PhD, because essentially, in a couple of years following 51 peg, nobody believed us. We were the only one. And uh, I was kind of left aside because, of course, I did that. There was nothing really wrong with the way I was doing the stuff, but it just didn't fit into what people were expecting it. So, and there are also other very specific reasons to believe that maybe there is something intrinsically wrong there. If you look at the sun, there are spots on the sun. And uh, the kind of signal we, we got is by building up all this kind of profile together. Well, when you rotate the sun and with a spot on it, what you make when you rotate the stuff, when you make it, you make a structure, and the structure is changing a little bit the line, exactly like that. It, it produces a kind of a shadow, and, and the shape of the line is changing. When you change the shape of the line, you change the, the, the speed of the star. So you can, you can trick us. You can easily trick and, and, and assume that the atmosphere is making something weird. There is a way to assess that, and we did it properly in the paper. We went in, in many detail. Actually, the paper is, most about, is mostly about rejecting all the other possibilities than but dealing with the data itself, because this is really the issue. And actually, there is a lot of tiny, difficult elements. Like, if you look at the, just the speed, the speed pattern of the sun, this is the speed pattern of the sun you have here. Um, it, there is kind of granulation. You see it. It's not very flat. There is kind of a noise. And if you look here, there's even a, a structure. The structure corresponds to that kind of structure here, which is magnetic field. This is a magnetic magnetogram. You measure the magnetic field of the sun. So you can have magnetic field. Some cases it's visible. It's related to spot, but not always. So you can have a lot, a lot of tricks and pulsations. And actually, we had to fight a very severe criticism uh, that possibly 
the only thing we've, we've detected is, is the star and the star motion and atmosphere motions. And it, it took us quite a lot of time to survive this. And the reason why we survived this, because at some point everybody got exhausted in trying to fight us. I never find any good reason that we were wrong. And something major happened is in 99, this is the 95 when the discovery was done. There was a couple of planets, but not very much. A number of planets been detected. A transit was found on a similar object. So what happened is if you got lucky enough, you can be in a configuration where the planet goes just in front of the star and you. So it makes a shadow at that time. If you get the signal from the radio velocity and you get the transit at the same time, which is exactly what we had, the star is, is famously known as HD209458. And then, well, it's kind of <laughs> the way we have it, but it's kind of a name that a lot of people are aware of. And, and maybe not you, but in astronomy, I can tell you, they're crazy about that star. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and everybody starts to be convinced at that time. But for 95 to uh, 99, it was a really tough time for me. Really, it was very tough. Michel was easier. He was a professor of university. He had an easy game. But, but me, I was not at all in the situation at that time. But I didn't care. I believed I was right. So in a way, it ended up not too bad for me at this point. But, but I was really tough. So what happened then after that, the interest for the community started to grow, and we started designing new kind of instruments. So in 1908, I built another instrument called Coralie. It was a kind of a copy, a clone copy with a bit enhanced capability. And uh, Coralie was, up till now, uh, uh, one of the most successful spectrograph um, detecting planets. It was installed in Chile. So after going every time to, uh, to, to, um, um, to Haute Provence, I went to Chile quite a lot. I've been, I've been, I don't know how much time I've been going to Chile then. It was, a, it was an interesting time. At, at least I did something useful. I learned Spanish at that time. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then you see the data coming up. So the detection discovery started to pop up. Other, other uh, teams also started to be active as well. So, but it was really a, a handful of people doing that. So something so, um, slowly started to happen is when people realized that there were so many planets, and most of them in short period, then they realized that there must be a lot of transit. And the ground-based program started to kickstart, and you see this kind of pale blue here, which is essentially a program which has been built in UK. Actually, this, uh, this program is called WASP or Super WASP. Uh, it's Professor Don Polacco, who was the one who believed that. He started in 1999 after the transit. He realized they were a big program, and he started to pick up the transit. Uh, also, um, space program, the French mission Coro started to, um, uh, to, to, to consider flying emissions not for this, but for asteroid seismology, but they realized they could trick the system and make it work as well, and they started to have transit discovery. So gradually, the number of discovery in the, in the same amount of time, we moved to maybe a handful, to about 50, and then 2005, 2010, we reached in a number of 300. And then the field become, started to become very popular, but we were missing a bit big, because there was mostly us, some team in the US, but very rarely um, the French uh, community, the UK community, but we were missing a big community, which was the big US community at that time. So what happened is, in 99, after the first transit, everybody con got convinced that a real space mission should be flying, and should be flown, and this, this, um, this space mission is famously known as Kepler. And uh, Kepler, the idea of Kepler is from the 80s, practically. Uh, but in 99, I was a kickstart, because it was obvious with all these planets that we would need these missions. And Kepler is this. So I was a completely turned over into the field because Kepler, with the capability of the, of the space missions, had been finding zillions of planets. Actually, the, the, this number, and I stopped in 2015 because it keeps going, but it just gives you an idea of these explosions of planets. as so a transit missions. Of course, the other program, uh, the, the, the ground-based program expanded. Uh, new instruments were developed, and then we have on and on and on, and new, new techniques. I don't want to describe all the techniques. So, so the field of exoplanet has moved from none, really, to uh, starting with kind of awkward discovery into this kind of booming uh, element. And there's so many right now, and, and so many people working with that. And Kepler was great because the whole U.S. community get involved into that. And now we have a really a worldwide effort interested into this, and a lot of other missions being going on. So what I want to try to explain to you is where we sit right now. So from this first discovery is so bizarre, where we are, and what is the, the meaning of these discoveries? What is the significance? And what have we learned about uh, our universe and the way, um, the way we... Uh, I have to check by the time because I don't have my watch. Okay, here we are. Um, so, yeah, I'm fine. Um, great. 
So that's uh, uh, the simplest way to get the, to get the picture of what we found. So using three parameters. I can use many, but that's that's the best way to explain it in a simple way. So if you if you just compile all the known planets that have been found, and and you, you you consider only two parameters that we extract from the transit, essentially you extract the size of the planet or the radius, planet radius. That's what I have here on the on that side, on the left side. And one is the size of the Earth, one Earth radius. Ten is the size of Jupiter. To help you, this is where Jupiter sits and Earth sits. Because here this is a period, the orbiting period of the orbital period of the planet, 300 days, and that's about uh, uh, 11 years here for Jupiter. Okay, that's the transit. If you look at the radial velocity, what you get is a mass. Essentially, it's a mass. Um, and uh, the mass here is expressed also in Earth. This is one, sorry, scientific unit is 100. Jupiter is 300 times the Earth. So 300 times the Earth makes the mass of Jupiter. That's why Jupiter sits over there, and similarly on the period. Okay, the color code is the same than before, depending on the discovery techniques. It's not really relevant here. Okay, so what I want to, to uh, draw attention to you is what we have here. So essentially, we have different kind of population of planets, and, and if you really think this through, uh, they are this quite puzzling situations. So well, the first one is this one, which is essentially shorter planet with the size of the order of Jupiter. Or, if you take exactly the same here, uh, it's the same kind of planet, detected in a different way. Maybe it's the same planet in some case, maybe it's not, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's the uh, same kind of period, but the kind of mass of Jupiter. We call that the hot Jupiter. 51 peg is part of these populations. So we start picking up that stuff. And actually, when I, when I defended my PhD, I remember, and I had this argument that said, well, I can't believe I'm, I'm, this object is so unique because it would be too lucky. And I can't believe too luck. I mean, how can I get this? Uh, we only start 20 stars, 24 stars, and I pick one. And it just it has to be something else. And I mentioned at that time that that was the tip of the iceberg. And actually, it is essentially the tip of the iceberg. The iceberg is down here. Because when you start to improve the sensitivity of the techniques, you're able to detect smaller and smaller planets when you go to space. I mean, eventually. So here, this is the Kepler discoveries. So Kepler has opened our eyes into uh, a population of planets, which is also a short period, but with a size which is from the size of the Earth up to the size of somewhere like um, Saturn here. So this kind of population here that you see also in radio velocity there, they're also the same, of the mass of the Earth-ish to uh, the mass of, of Saturn, and with period from one day to 50 days about. Um, we are very creative. We call that the super, super Earth or mini Neptunes or all these kind of names. We don't really know what it is because there is no counterpart in the solar system. Because in the solar system, it's either you are Jupiter or you are Earth-ish. It's not much. If you are Saturn or Uranus, you're much further there in terms of distance. So there is no counterpart of this kind of population there. The only planet that we do detect and that have some counterpart of these bits here so they're not visible in transit because when a planet is very far away, let's say with a period of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 days, so the likelihood to be strictly aligned between the star and the planet uh, becomes unlikely. So you need to observe so many, so many stars to get locally a transit. That's why there's so few. So there's a lot of threshold of limits. Of, it's difficult to, to see this diagram and to see it as a global population, kind of a uniformized population in terms of probability. But it gives you an idea that um, they are here definitely of the size of Jupiter, but when you use the, 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 the radial velocity, which is much more sensitive to this object, um, there's plenty. So we have a discovery space here. But if you pay attention to the number, Jupiter is here. So we have an object which is much, much more heavy than Jupiter. Two times, three times, five times, six times, ten times, twenty times. What do you stop? Exactly. There's a point when you know we make a star, which 80 times the Jupiter is enough pressure to make you like a star. But what is exactly the limit here? We don't know. Or well, this population is also a bit awkward because if you look at the most of these orbits, you realize that they're not really nice like the solar system and lies like a circ circular orbit. They're a bit eccentric, and uh, we don't really know why. So we have a complete different picture from the one we have in the solar system. Now, the fact we have nothing here and nothing here, it's not because there is nothing, it's just because so far it is failing the detections because we can't find it. It's too difficult right now. So of course we're working and we're working quite hard and we're moving down, we're moving down and we will eventually be detecting this object there. That's really the essence 
of the work that we're doing today and I'm doing today is to get down because it's frustrating for the situations. But without that, I think there's a lot of lessons learned from this, which was a kind of a shock. The first one is, what is the likelihood uh, when you observe a star to have one orbiting hot Jupiter? Well, actually, it's between five, 1 to 4%. Uh, it depends on the nature of the star. And in a way, when you think about this number, I picked 20, 20, 25 stars. I got one of two, 25. I got lucky, but not extremely lucky, actually. It's two sigma piece of luck. If you do lottery every day, it's something you get every two, three months. So it's OK. So I get a bit lucky, which always needs a bit of piece of luck when you do a PhD anyway. So that's OK. <laughs> but that's the kind of population. This is kind of a rare object. So they are, they are the outcome of a process which is not common. And that's interesting um, um, information we get. But what was a big surprise is these bits. Because when you run the statistics of these bits, you realize that when you pick a star, there is between 50 to 80% chance to have one. 50 to 80% chance. These objects have no counterparts in the solar systems. So what we've learned from that is the solar system is not the majority, just by the reverse argument. So that was a kind of a big shock because the solar system is one of the many possibilities. So it, isn't, it doesn't rule out the fact that it, it may be 5, 10% or 20%. But this idea that we had 30 years ago that everything would look like the solar system is absolutely wrong. It's based on an assumption that it was based on the fact it was only a piece of information available. And uh, what, what 51 Pet did, it opened our eyes because it picked up a very strange planet. It was tough to convince the community it was real. But because this is a reality, so we find out we managed to find plenty of other planets. And in a way, that was a piece of luck because if these planets would not exist, well, maybe today I will not be sitting here. I will be doing something else because we would have waited. If only the solar system would exist, the, the likelihood to detect this planet is extremely more difficult. So, so we have all this population that's great. And now we have to find out why is it like that and why the solar system is different. So the main mechanism that people are trying to think about right now is when you form a system into a disk, there is way more motion than you thought about it. It's like when you, you're born somewhere and you stop moving away. So it's exactly what happened here. So the fact you have a planet being formed at a given location, because it's still the assumption due to the nature and what you detect into the atmosphere of this planet, this is moving. So the planet is moving to the star because of the dynamic with the disk. And you need a kind of a special configuration to not have these motions. So the whole likelihood it is to have this, we don't know. But we better find out whether we are extremely rare or if you're marginally rare or if we are kind of 10% here. So we kind of trying to assess this, but that's the kind of the big, big story. Now we left with the rest over there, and we know it's about 10%. So maybe this this kind of population is telling us that about 10% of the planet, when they being formed, they kind of stay a little bit outside. So maybe this is give you a hint of the likelihood to have a, an equivalent of the solar system. It's not very solid because it's not exactly what we're talking about here. If you look at the one that have a strictly circular orbit. It's only 10% only of this 10%, so it's only 1%. 1% of, these, of, the, of the occurrence rate will give you a Jupiter equivalent. So, this, so in a way, it's easier to, uh, to detect a hot Jupiter than to have a Jupiter, actually, in terms of occurrence into, uh, uh, in any stars you, have, you can look in the sky. So that is really something interesting, and people are trying to digest this. What are the consequences of that? Then there's even more massive consequence about life, but I will have to come back and disable that. So the other interesting piece of information of the, of the puzzle is some of these planets, we have the mass and the size at the same time. So uh, you must remember, for the non-physicists, mass and size give you the density, right? You just, have, you just need to, put the, to have the radius to the cube here. And uh, these are the kind of diagram you can draw in this case. Most of these planets are short period, so they're kind of special. So you still overlay Jupiter here. Uh, here you have Neptune, and then you have the Earth. So what is interesting here to sit to put some typical number like the water. So the water density is one gram back per cubic centimeter. It's over there. So it, it would be a kind of a line around that. So if you have a planet only with a bulk density made of water, uh, you would be around this line over there. So you see Jupiter is interesting due to the pressure. It's a bit heavier. It's below. So anything below is denser. Um, uh, Neptune is about the same. It's smaller, but uh, uh, there's a bit more heavy element there in, 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 in the center, but because less pressure, there's the, the, the density plays about the same. Uh, Saturn will be just on the other side. It's a bit more fluffier. 
but essentially what you have here, we have all this population of hot Jupiter, which turn out to be a little bit more uh, bigger than, than Jupiter. So the density of most of these hot Jupiter is less than Jupiter. So this fact that they are very hot, they have, a, they have a weaker density, and we don't really understand all the details. It must be related to the fact they're very close to the stars, but we don't really understand the physics yet, why it's like that. Um, well, when you start going down, in a way, you keep seeing the kind of population here, which is not a big surprise. Saturn will sit here, and then you're getting down, and then it becomes really interesting here, because you start to have a, a kind of a mixing of populations. So now I have to go back from the other side, which is from the Earth. So the Earth density is seven, uh, sorry, five grams per cubic centimeter. It's silicate. So it's much more heavy, it's there. And what you find out is when you have this kind of object between two, three, four, five Earth mass over there, well, actually, there is a kind of a big mixing of populations. So you can encounter, when you detect planets within this, this regime, anything that would be like Neptune's or something like the Earth. And that's a very interesting um, uh, situation right now because it may direct us to a completely different formation scenario. So maybe you have a scenario such that you form this planet a similar way than the Earth, or you form this planet similarly than Neptune's, but then you make them moving, or you make them like Neptune, but they are so close to the stars that you streak them out. Exactly the kind of scenario we mentioned 30 years ago, remember, for 51 peg. So actually, this paper about 51 peg is fascinating because I, I, I had to read it, but before the Nobel Prize ceremony, just in case I get questioned about it, I wanted to make sure. <laughs> and I realized, oh my God, we were really kind of a, a visionary in all the idea because all the stuff we were mentioning in the paper actually is happening, everything. And all the techniques we're mentioning, all the possibilities are exactly what we have now. That's just the reality uh, of the data, uh, what the, the, the data have been telling us uh, uh, in, the, in all these years. So, um, so essentially what we have right now is an interesting situation when you have this kind of massive uh, Jupiter, like we understand Jupiter, then there's Neptune, but then we, when you're talking about the small planets, it can be anything. It can be something like the Earth, which is but a tiny atmosphere, big mental and small the core, it's a bit too, too, too big here. Uh, or you can remove all the atmosphere and make a very massive iron core and you get something extremely dense. It's the same mass, just the density is just higher. So you have much more dense material, so it takes less space. So you get a smaller planet. Uh, or you uh, change a little bit the rules and you uh, decrease the mantle, so you add a bit more atmosphere. It can be anything, it can even be uh, hydrogen as a gas. It can be the atmosphere, anything. It can be water, we call that water world, anything. And then you will make something bigger. So the trick is you use this kind of idea when you measure the mass on the size to tell us a bit what it is. But there is a limit, because when you have the mass on the size, instead of the density, you still want to understand better. And what I'm trying to do right now is to get the atmosphere of the planet. And there is ways to do that. It's pretty efficient, and we're using a lot of telescopes to do that these days, kind of ongoing program. Because when the planet goes in front and in the back, it tells you something about the atmosphere of the planet. Well, when the planet goes in front, it's pretty easy to understand. Part of the light from the star go uh, crossing the, uh, the atmosphere of the planet. Some, they just get stopped. Other, they crosses. They go through this. It's a bit like an X-ray, in a way, if you want to understand that. So depending on the wavelength, you have a kind of a signature here. And you can guess what kind of particle you have. Water is easy to pick. There's a lot of uh, elements you can pick easily. So that's being used to study the atmosphere of a planet. You can also study what's called the, the day side. Just before the planet goes behind, it's a day side because that's the, the, you have the light from, um, from the sun and uh, you just see, either you, you see the day side of the planet as a reflection of the flux or you see the thermal emission because you get heat on that side. You know, the, the, the moon between the day side of the moon uh, and, and, the, and the dark side, there's a big difference in temperature quite significant because there is no atmosphere. If you get atmosphere, the difference is but more, way more milder, but there's still a bit of difference, but it's almost nothing. That's what happens when you have an atmosphere, because the atmosphere brings you the circulations and protects you against this. So we can study the response of the day side against the night side when the planet is in the other direction. So you can guess about the nature of the atmosphere by studying this. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing with all this planet, and that's how we're learning what they're made of. And we found water on some of them, we found some, some other molecules, and we're trying to make sense into that and to understand where they've been formed and why they are there. And that's kind of a big game, and uh, it's a big game where we have only a piece of information. When you think about that, 
it's just a bit, a bit magic because we don't have picture. I didn't see you any picture right now. We don't, we don't get almost nothing. We just observe this telescope, get some hint, some data point, and then I tell you a story about what they look like, what the mass, what the size, just magic. This is the beauty of physics. You don't need to have the stuff next to you to make sense to that. You have a lot of uh, element you use to make, uh, to make something that is rational and makes sense. I know I can tell you for hours about what the nature of the planet with essentially nothing to show you. Just you have to believe me with the data I'm showing you. So this is very, very interesting bit of it. So I'd like to mention a little bit at the end a very interesting concept that is quite a lot in the media and to just as a kind of a starting point for, for the, the future of the field. This is um, usually the way we define the habitable zone. So, so essentially what you do is uh, you compute the closest uh, orbit you can move the Earth or the farther away you can sit without losing the water. On, on one side you get too close, you evaporate the water. On the other side the water becomes just solid and it's not any more liquid water. So we define this kind of, of course it depends on the atmosphere, and if you add a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, as we're doing right now, you change a bit the balance. So, so you can play with that uh, a little bit. But just forgot about the atmosphere to make it simple. There's still some limit. Closest and further away you can go. And this defines the, what's called the habitable zone. So you see the habitable zone in the case of the Earth right now, which sit about between Venus and Mars, essentially. Now, the problem we have with this right now is that's the way we explain the minimum condition. It doesn't say anything about life, but it, it is understood that you need water for life. That's the minimum condition for life. Now, the problem we have is most of the planets I've shown you before, and if you pay attention, they were planets of the size of the Earth, of the mass of the Earth, but they were non-planets with the mass of this Earth, the size of the Earth, and the period of the Earth, right? They were much closer. So essentially, they're all fitting into this box. So the problem we're having right now is essentially all the planets we're finding and all, mostly all the planets in the galaxy, remember 50-80%, they are within this box. So they don't qualify for the habitable zone, essentially. But there is a trick, because the habitable zone changes depending on the temperature of the star. If you decrease a little bit the temperature of the star, namely you have to move to another star, which is smaller, uh, less mass, so there's less more pressure, so there's the thermal combustion is different. So you move down into the mass of the star, you move down into the size of the star, and this is what this diagram tried to explain here by moving the mass of the star down and down. And you can do quite a lot. You can, you can get a star which only 10% of the mass of the, of the sun. So the star here, they only have 10% of the mass of the star. And what is interesting with these stars, this is the most common star you find in the galaxy. They call M stars. So for one sun, I, get, I give you 10 stars like that. So essentially, the galaxy is full of stars of that kind. Now, this becomes interesting bits. Is because we're finding all these planets, this planet also exists for all these stars. And then, magically, when you use the statistics I show you, but I bring it down to that star, there's plenty of planets within the habitable zone. That's why you see in the press, we found planets in the habitable zone. We have the possibility of life on this planet because actually people have been clever. And they say, okay, because we're finding all this planet, why don't we look at this planet but on star a bit less massive than the sun? And you go down here, and there's some example here, but no, there's way more here. I mean, there must be a dozen that fits into this criteria. So we're looking for planets into this region here. And uh, with my colleagues of Liège, we have been recently finding, trying to look for the very extreme case because what is pretty cool when you look at this object is the habitable zone is so close, so you can sit within, within an orbit of similar to 51 peg, actually just 5% uh, of the orbit of, uh, of the Earth, just here, 0.05 AU. And uh, actually this is where we recently found uh, this system of, uh, of TRAPPIST. So I just want to, to explain to you a bit the concept here uh, in a way to give you the, the story for the future. Is trappist system is a very extreme system, very close, but the star is extremely tiny as well. So the temperature that, uh, that is provided from the star, I mean, in a scale is similar to the one we have in the solar system. But essentially, practically, the system is very small, it's very close. But if you decrease the temperature, you get to something similar. So it's a mini or it's a miniature uh, solar system, if you want. And when you compute the mass on the side, you realize that all these planets have the mass of the size of the Earth, roughly speaking. So we know they're all kind of rocky, all of them. So we have system, it's a very extreme system, but there's others, so that's, this one is very famously known. So we have system that fits the criteria. 
Now, the problem we have with this is the star is very, very different. So if we imagine the possibility of an atmosphere or the possibility of life, would that be the same kind of life? And this, nobody knows about this. But there's a, certainly an interesting starting point for discussion here. And uh, there's a lot of program, and I've started a kind of intensive program with a couple of colleagues here in Cambridge. And one of them is John Sutherland and Paul Rimmer in the, in the room. I saw you before. And they're trying to, to understand this. I mean, could we have life on the system? What is the possibility here? So the astronomy perspective on that uh, is very optimistic because we are moving to the next generation of tools. And I want to show you my, uh, my, my kind of uh, tools or my toys, if you want, <laughs> as an astronomer, that for which we're going to play for the next uh, decades and 20 years. So first of all, we're going to fly uh, much bigger space telescopes like this one. This is James Spring Space Telescope. The size of the mirror is six meters. So compared to the two meter class, we're flying you know, HST. It's a major change. It's a, it's a cool telescope. It will go in L2 behind the moon. So it will be operated in a much cooler environment. So the idea is we should be able to detect atmosphere on some of these planets. Not very much, but enough as a teaser to move to the next generation of even the bigger ones. So the other big kit we're building is this uh, massive telescope that is part of the European Software Observatory, uh, who the UK belongs to as a member. This is something which is not related to Brexit, so don't worry about it. So <laughs> there's no way they're going to skip this one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the mirror is 39, 39 meters. It's really a massive telescope. And to get an idea, this is a car. And I tell you, this is a Chilean car. This is the SUV car. It's not a small car that you have here. This is really a big one. <laughs> and, uh, and this is on top of, of, a, of a mountain. It's a beautiful site in Paranal. And with this telescope, we should be able to detect water and even oxygen in some of this, uh, from this atmosphere. So this is the kind of stuff we will be doing on, on, uh, on, on the, these discoveries. And then there is a, a, a major program that I've started here moving in Cambridge called Terra Hunting. I guess we know how to find the Earth twin. It just requires a new strategy, a new kind of instrument. And we're building here in Cambridge with a lot of other partners in Europe and in the US a new generation. So it would be the fourth generation of instrument. So 30 years after LOD, roughly, uh, I think we will eventually reach the stage when we can build an equipment and operate a, a telescope to find uh, what we consider right now at the, at the end of the game, which is finding the, the Earth, the real Earth equivalent, to get an idea how likely all the other Earth. Um, I will stop here thanking you, and I hope I just conveyed the excitement of the field and how much fun it was, while the beginning was a bit tough, I must admit. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> a tour de force. Now I know why they've named an asteroid after. <laughs> um, questions? Gosh. Yes, please. Vivian, can, yeah. can I be a little bold? Yes. If you hadn't 